influenced me a lot too because I felt <clears throat> even though I had um, been a part of the uh, civil rights movement of the sit-ins on my college campus um, I I was just a part of that doing having the experience with the encampment left me with a, a sense of um, empowerment that I really had the power to influence other people to tell our story. Our whole focus was poverty, Appalachia, and civil rights. So we saw poverty and lived with the poverty in that week's experience. But it wasn't until the encampment that I actually felt like that was my fight as well. So I internalized it. I realized that I wasn't just a witness to what was going on around me, that I actually could be an active player, and not just could be, but needed to be. It was at the encampment that I found that spark, that I found that kind of twist in my reality, that indeed I needed to do something to try and make my mark and create change in the world. It also opens your eyes to so many issues in the world that while you might have learned about them in school, you've never really seen firsthand and it really gives you a deeper understanding of the ways in which our society needs to change, needs to fix itself. Matthew East Spetter, uh, uh, a man from Holland. And I re thing I remember of him is wearing a short sleeve shirt and a big tattoo of numbers down his arm. And he never spoke of them, but he spoke of, uh, of looking ahead, you know, and uh, that things can be better, but you've got to make them better. And I just found it to be the most exciting six weeks that I'd spent in my life because it really had a bearing on everything I did and relationships that I had. I started out as a teacher, I, um, and I was very active in the teachers' union in Los Angeles. And for eight years, I was an officer of United Teachers Los Angeles. Um, got arrested. <laughs> for a teacher strike. So really the encampment just had a great impact on my life. Growing up, this was the first time I got to talk about it with people and hear people's stories more directly. And people really shared with me what it was like to be targeted by racism. And that was huge for me. I needed that information so deeply. Um, and what it did is it, it gave me, it, it was empowering gave me tools and, and the sense of power, that I had power with my privilege. My first taste at actually applying myself to some kind of social justice was in the encampment. We went up to DC and uh, sat down with the DOJ and we had a focus group meeting that talked about the problems in our communities. And so everybody had different problems in their communities and we all got to share that and try to advocate for something and feel like our voices were heard as like 16 year olds. Our charge was, Sit in this room and get together and figure it out and figure out how to work with each other. We, we know we're all from different places. I mean, this is what I remember believing, and I think I'm accurate in saying this, that we came from different religious backgrounds. We came from different uh, layers of the socioeconomic strata. We came from different geographic areas, you know, so it, it was the beginning of saying, hey, you know, you've got to work it out if you want to get along in this world. My experience there was very eye-opening. Although I knew there was racism, but I think we experienced a lot of that in Bobbitsville, Kentucky. We were an interracial group in the middle of a hollow in Bobbitsville, Kentucky. And we got all kinds of pressures from threats, bomb threats to uh, harassments. And I know our leaders protected us a lot. I learned about like 
all the different issues that were going on and how to pay attention to like what's going on in government and how things work and how things work to divide us and um, and how we can work to reunite each other and um, help each other as you know human beings should. The intensity of the whole thing. There's there's no words for uh, how every day kind of shaped my thinking about the world and uncovered a lot of the uh, baloney that uh, I had been fed about the world and uh, and mm. solidarity just all all through it. So I've learned a lot about Mississippi history and the legacies of slavery, sharecropping, mass incarceration, convict leasing, um, a lot of the current issues that still face communities in Mississippi, as well as um, the culture and the language and people of the Choctaw Nation. I learned that we're not individuals living this privileged life, but we are part of a network that is woven and strengthened as we live and work together. And one of our encampers was proactive and got Malcolm X to meet with us. And I'm not sure, I can't remember if he came to Fieldston to meet with us or if we went somewhere to meet him. I think he came up to Fieldston. Um, I think most of us from that year developed a sense of empowerment. We felt we could do anything. And I think that helped us through our life. I began to understand the extraordinary gifts that I had been given by being exposed and working and living with people who didn't not just look like me, but think like me, people that came from different cultural backgrounds, people had different values. That was, that was vitally important to helping me become who I am as a leader, as a community member, as a family member. It made me more empathic. I flew um, many states away from my house. And so when I arrived, it was something that was very special and it was something very different. Um, the topics really were new to me because a lot of the topics were taught in school, but not to the extent and the depth of um, the encampment, the way the encampment taught and spoke about these topics like discrimination. Finally, with the encampment, I just burst into a world of so many different people, so many different experiences, and it challenged the ways I had kind of like the unconscious ways that were projected onto me in the growing up, even, uh, and I loved it. And so I think it really did set the tone for the rest of my life. The other thing about the encampment, I think it just anchored me again in um, commitment to equity and justice and deep friendships. And I really haven't changed very much. <laughs> and I think I owe a lot of that to the encampment. Thank you. The encampment made it happen. We built a democracy, we lived a democracy, and we talked about issues that are not talked about in schools even less today than they were then. Community and communion with other, with other youth who, um, who came from other parts of the country who are also in some way engaged in, with their own community. Um, and they weren't just talking about what the latest, you know, a show was and um, or the latest fashion trends. They were actually talking about um, um, about things that mattered to me. Um, the encampment has taught me the importance of community activism because I um, am very aware of like the political climate like nationwide. However, like this being here made me realize I don't know the councilman who's representing me. Um, like I, I don't know. Like I don't know the people who are representing me and the people in my neighborhood. And my mother doesn't know. And there are a lot of people like in my neighborhood don't know. So, like just like on the basic like local level, there are people speaking for us without us knowing who's actually speaking for us and without our actual input. And I always remember Nanny Pollitzer saying, uh, "One person can do something." Um, don't, don't be overwhelmed when, you know, if you see something before it became a cliche, say, do something. I always had the encampment spirit as part of uh, my motivation or my, not my motivation, my uh, way of acting that if the room was silent and there had to be a protest, I did not feel inhibited. And I could hear the echoes from the encampment saying, uh, somebody has to speak up. And I remember going to 
here, South Dakota, to talk to the governor. That was like my first introduction to really uh, a different side of politics and how people thought. So like now it all makes sense. Recognized the word prejudice in quite a new way. And it gave me courage to step in every time I thought it was necessary for the rest of my life. So I'm really grateful for it. And we went to the uh, fields and we picked strawberries. We listened to the folks who were organizing the farm workers union. Uh, we heard from the growers and what their issues were. We were exhausted, but that was perhaps, I never bought a pint of strawberries ever again without thinking about how much work and how little pay people got for giving me the privilege of being able to buy a pint of strawberries. The encampment has taught me how to express my opinions to people who don't necessarily feel the same way without yelling or um, getting frustrated with them. Even though we're not directly putting on the encampment hat in, in the day-to-day -day work that we do and, and screaming out encampment to the people that we're talking to, we are the embodiment of the encampment in the work that we do. Managed uh, both counties and cities and uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, brought a, uh, an entrepreneurial spirit to uh, the way government should be operated and made governments far less bureaucratic and more responsive uh, and more just in, in many ways. And I credit that to the encampment uh, background. I made a career in public service, first with the government of Puerto Rico, and then later with the U.S. government, working mostly in civil rights issues. That taught me how to take a subject and say, wow, this thing has many facets. I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to look at it in different ways. And I'm not going to make my mind up based upon what we would now call a sound bite. So I really took kind of the message from the encampment about like youth leadership. I took that to heart. I feel like when coming back from the encampment, um, I started a gay straight alliance, which is so like outdated now, <laughs> I feel like in society. Um, so it's kind of like cute to think back, like only five years ago, we thought that was like revolutionary. I've worked for um, access programs such as TRIO Student Support Services for low income first generation students with disabilities. I've worked at a pride center for the past year. I was very impressed by the fact that a black professor came and told us his work uh, and his contribution to the uh, Supreme Court decision. And I thought to myself, now here's this professor talking to us as young students, and he's using his expertise to help his people. I ended up being the first woman chair of my tribe, the Menominee tribe the first woman assistant secretary of Indian Affairs in the Department of Interior in the Clinton administration. And so the encampment experience was a very foundational experience for me. There's a lot of power that you can use in those positions. So in one stroke of my pen, I doubled the number of federally recognized tribes in this country. The other thing that we did in Great Falls, I'm sure it's crosses over to all the different encampments is, is get involved in local issues. Um, I was on the environmental group, the team, if you will, uh, in Great Falls, and we cleaned up a part of the Missouri River. And I've always loved this connection and this, this way of being with young people. I have a community as a part of that toolkit, a group of people as like a source of like, of like power in a sense, um, I think is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. helped equip me with some community development skills, which I went back to my university, which was in Queens University in Kingston and started a student volunteer bureau. I noticed that there were a lack of resources from just my peers within the encampment. So like stuff I'm doing now is really providing that platform for people. So for example, you know, I went back to school and I started the Multicultural Student Union, but like as an alum at Williston, I now kind of I'm really pushing the headmasters to, you know, hire a diversity recruiter to hire um, a person to work within admissions um, and fixing curriculum and things of that nature. So I'm still fighting as usual. Oh.